All right, welcome back to the SW Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Mia Huang, who insisted I be calling her Mia from now on. So I'm really excited to have Mia on the podcast today. And from, I would say, this, this workshop point of view, this is definitely going to be a little bit different today because Mia definitely offers more biological applications to her chemistry, but ones that you're certainly going to want to hear about today. And, um, you know, on that, you know, research within... Uh, glycan chemistry, um, glycomes, proteomes, and, you know, ultimately understanding those so that you can do, uh, well, I mean, ultimately to understand cancer biology and stem cell fates. And certainly we're going to talk about that in, in due good time, but I um, definitely want to start with you know, Mia's background because um, it's certainly a unique one. And I think um, it'll be insightful for a lot of, uh, for a lot of people out there. Um, I've, um, I was looking it up. You know, you grew up in the Philippines. I have don't really know much, much about Southeast Asia at all. Um, but I should also mention you are traditionally Chinese, but you grew up in the Philippines. Um, so I'll let you kind of take it from here a little bit about your background, because like I mentioned, I don't really know much about Southeast Asia in general. Um, that's kind of where I lack, but um, I'm excited to, to hear about it from your perspective. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Aiden, for the invitation to do this. I think it's always fun to um, get to know the people behind the science. So happy to share um, what my experience has been like. Uh, I did grow up in the Philippines, uh, specifically in Manila, which is the capital city of the Philippines. Really nice city, probably very uh, congested with traffic, um, much more so now than when I was growing up. Um, I come from a family of immigrants. My dad is originally from Taiwan, but immigrated to the Philippines in the late 70s and early 80s, and whereas my mom has been in the Philippines as a third generation Filipino Chinese. If you mm. ever go to Southeast Asia, because you know um, countries are in proximity to each other, but also the Philippines has been a melting pot of different cultures. We've had um, a rich history of being colonized by Spain um, and Portugal and then um, Japan. To some extent, there, there's a melting pot of different cultures in Southeast Asia. And the Chinese people uh, are well represented and kind of created their own micro environment um, of uh, what what I grew up in, uh, like a Filipino Chinese culture. It definitely has Filipino elements to it. We love our adobo, but also grew up, I grew up in the backdrop of Catholicism and um, uh, being immersed in the Chinese culture as well. Yeah, so it's kind of fun. Um, I was always brought up to be cognizant of um, all of these different people around me, um, uh, learn to speak multiple languages as a result, as a result of that. Um, it's a well, fun place to grow up. What languages can you speak? Uh, I, presume I speak English, Mandarin, um, Mandarin um, Taiwanese, which is a um, dialect of um, Chinese, um, mm. as well as Filipino. Um, you know, I mentioned the Philippines as being colonized by a number of different countries, but also heavily influenced by America. And so the school that I grew up in was actually a Christian school um, that mm. was initially built by a co cooperative um, cooperation between American missionaries and um, Filipino Chinese people. So I grew mm. up speaking English in the school. You know, we spent half the day learning um, your mathematics and um, science subjects um, in English, but then in the afternoons, you also spend the same subjects learning about them in Chinese and then uh. a little bit in Filipino. So. Yeah, you got you get immersed immersed in um, different languages, um, even on the same topics. Just on that, real quick, because I'm I'm pretty I'm very ignorant when it comes to like languages. So, is there like any overlap between Filipino and Mandarin? Or is it really like entirely different? Like I I, I have no idea. It's entirely different. Okay. Um, being in a melting pot country like the Philippines, they did adopt some of the vocabulary a little bit, but not that much. Um, Filipino, you can think of it, or Tagalog is an uh, amalgam of um, Malay as well as a little bit of Spanish, whereas mm -hmm. Chinese is completely different. Okay. So, like you mentioned, you said you grew up in the capital of the Philippines in, in Manila. Um, there, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Now, there are, I'm looking at a map here because I, I need to get my, my worldview straight here. There are, there are plenty of islands. For any, out of curiosity, I mean, are there, I mean, let's say are there the, non-traditional 
visitation spots for if people want to go visit the Philippines, you would recommend um, maybe the, obviously there's the trendy spots, um, but are there any places that you'd, you'd recommend personally? Yeah, um, I have never been, but I've always wanted to go to this place called Bohol, B-O-H-O-L. It's in the southern part of the Philippines. It is composed mm -hmm. of multiple islands. There's about 7,000 of them. Uh, but Bohol, <laughs> I think, is um, unique in my head because it, they host this little, the smallest, uh, it's called a tarsier, T-A-R-S-I-E-R. -E it okay. is a really cute animal. It's a nocturnal um, species. Um, and it's the smallest primate, primate known, um, and it's uniquely found only in this area of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it right now. It looks like it's, so Boho has got to be what, over 300 miles though from Manila. It's pretty far. It looks like. Right. You would definitely pretty... take a flight. Yeah. Um, but it's also has these really nice, uh, lot of wildlife sanctuary around. Um, yeah, I think the, if you, people think of the Philippines as a beach spot, which it is, so this is more mm -hmm. um, nature, but less beach. Mm -hmm. And one other question about the Philippines, you know, what kind of, I mean, what kind of traditional Filipino foods are there? Like, I don't really even know what, like, I don't even know what it's considered Filipino food. <laughs> uh, th that's where the, in the Spanish influence comes in. So adobo mm -hmm. is really popular. Um, but I think the Spanish version of the adobo versus the Filipino ones are still also a little bit different still, different spices. There's a little bit of Asian influence there. So um encourage everyone to check it out um but that's the super popular one but there's also less popular dishes that's one's made out of tamarind so it's got a little tangy uh taste so it's called sinigang um it's a dish that you um, make out of these uh tamarinds and they have this slightly acidic taste to them um but it's nevertheless tastes really good it's like a flavor that you wouldn't no normally imagine as being a dish yes well I need to get over to the Philippines. I need to get over to Southeast Asia in general. Um, just, I mean, I, I can't even imagine like the scenery there though. Um, it's probably second to none, uh, the landscape, the nature there. Um, so it's definitely, definitely on my bucket list. Now, moving into, you know, some science here. I, uh, I was, I was kind of going through and we talked about this a little bit beforehand, but you actually moved. I guess during your undergrad from the Philippines to the United States, I guess. So That's right. I, thought that was, I thought that was really intriguing that it's such a unique time to move. I mean, I know people that move, let's say when they're a lot younger, say middle school or high school, but it's not oftentimes that you'd hear someone move during their college. You, you know, people would say you'd live there for four years or whatever. So I'm yeah. curious to see what, you know, what kind of, why that was led to that. I, I basically graduated high school at 16, not because mm. I'm, you know, gifted, but just because of the way the educational system is set up. We don't have a middle school. So you go from six years of elementary to four years of high school. So I uh, ended up um, finishing high school at 16 and started to have these. I went to college in the Philippines at 16. And um, I was a biochemistry major at the University of the Philippines. And um, I started wanting more in terms of the science front, although I was a pre-med student. Um, and I started to look into different opportunities of how to um, obtain my studies, uh, further studies abroad. Mm -hmm. And there, one of the opportunities that I received was a small scholarship from the City University of New York, which helped fund a little bit of um, my move um, halfway through college. So on the age front, it kind of made sense that I was a little bit older and uh, classified as an adult to kind of move elsewhere. But also it was that opportunity that kind of popped up that helped me um, move to the United States. Yeah, I, uh, I, I find it extremely admirable because, boy, you, you must have moved literally across the world at 18, 19, right? Yeah, I mean, 18. how I mean, you got to you got to enlighten me a little bit here because that sounds I mean, I can imagine. I mean, I listen, I moved halfway across the country at 22, but moving halfway across the world at 18, that is crazy. Um, so I'd love to hear about, you know, that experience really. Um, you know, the, I think at 18, moving, um, first of all, a lot of people do it. Second of all, I think I was true. just truly excited at the opportunity. Um, yeah, I was cognizant that not many people get an opportunity like that, and I wanted to make the most of it. And there was a little bit of anxiety about and fear of what the future might look like. But I think I was too young, too dumb 
and too excited to worry Fair. about it. I, I was just uh, pursuing everything head on and seeing what I could get my hands on in terms of science and school. So um, I, I, I think it, I probably like much more aware of the world now than I am to, to like, uh, and more fearful of making that jump. But at, at, at 18, I, I think it was just pure fun. Yeah. I can, I, like, I don't know if you have any children, but I don't know if you could see, like, would you, could you see like your, one of your children, like moving like across the world at 18? I don't know. I, uh, 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 uh funny <laughs> enough, like you mentioned, I just had my first child. And so yeah, to think of him, Thank you. To think of him doing something like this 18 years later um, is, um, I hope I would be encouraging of it, but it also makes me reflect about what my parents were thinking when they actually let me go. It's the first time I've ever seen my dad cry the night I left. Wow. Wow. Yeah, this is a, I think, yeah, I guess, so backing up a little bit too, you, you mentioned that you were an undergraduate in biochemistry. I mean, were STEM in general, because I you know you like were thinking about becoming a medical doctor, so STEM mm-hmm. in general was always maybe something on on the on the plate. Um, now, I, I also noticed that you know your dad only has second level second grade level education. Your mom is uh, only has high school level education. So you know they really pushed you to do to pursue, um, you know, education generally. Um, so was STEM always a part of that, or how did that how did your those initial interests begin? Yeah, I think I need to back up a little bit, and um, because my my parents grew up in uh, yeah, economically challenging circumstances, mm. um, for them making money and making a living um, and potentially setting up a business was like the most the best way to make a living for anyone. Mm. And so the idea of doctors of the of, of being physician um, is an honorable profession, but you don't necessarily make money out of it. For them, the, because it's the path that um, that they were on, um, they wanted me to follow um, and become a, an entrepreneur like they were, or potentially just take over what they've built. You know, as a parent, you, you've like um, gone through all this hardship to build something for your children, mm. and of course, you want your offspring to take advantage of that. Um, and I think I uh, didn't want to necessarily pursue the same thing that they did, which I think is a little bit of a privilege as well for me to have a choice to think about what I actually want to do right. um, for them and that generation, having grown up under really hard circumstances. Um, my dad was brought up at a time when um, Taiwan wasn't what it is now. Now you have the semiconductor industry, but right. he tells me these stories about how the first time he wore shoes, like closed toe shoes was when he was 13. Wow. Uh, it's just like mind boggling to me. Um, but those were the circumstances that they grew up in and just, um, pushed their children, they pushed their children to make money and not be, um, uh, not have a hard life and poverty like they did. Right. Right. They, they, they definitely wanted the best for you, but it, perhaps it's like, it's always so hard to, even, even still now it's like, it's hard to understand how like a technical degree in science can actually far it could go. And I feel like that's really hard for people to kind of grasp. Um, yeah. I think at that time in the Philippines, um, the idea of a scientist wasn't necessarily a profession. Right. I had certainly never met anyone. My idea of a scientist was Dexter's Laboratory, the cartoon, <laughs> any of the 90s kids are out there. Um, that And, you know, I didn't want to be Dee Dee. I wanted to be Dexter, but I didn't necessarily want to be like a, a crazy scientist. I just right, right. like that was my idea of it. And so the closest thing that I knew uh, that felt real was being a physician. Mm-hmm. That makes that makes total sense. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit beforehand, but, you know, how many students out there who who their parents, you know, they want one thing because they built this foundation for the kids to take up on, but they're just the kids just aren't really it's just not really their dream. And so I, you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, people are I, I'd say I leave to hear this, but I don't know if that's the right word, but it's it's definitely a unique perspective, I think. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think it doesn't come from a bad place. It comes right, from them. Exactly them wanting their children to not face the same hardship they did. Um, but at the same time, there's this generational shift now. I remember telling my parents the first time that like, I can choose to not take what you built for me and choose to do something else. Mm-hmm. And for them, the idea of being a choice and like choosing happiness, even that you can choose your profession as part of your happiness 
was just they 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 could not fathom that you could do that. It's mm. almost akin to um, like perhaps what the America was like in the early 1900s when people were just trying to eke out a li- living and not necessarily thinking of the you know like um, what 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 could make them happy. It was about living and getting through day by day. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you got the appointment at, at Scripps, because in America, for better, or for worse, being a professor is certainly a, it's a, it's a, you know, prestige. There's a prestige that comes along with it. It's a lot of hard work. And so there's certainly a prestige when you, I don't know if you ever told me you're, you know, obviously you told me you're a Scripps professor. How'd they take it? They, they even like really know what that means. Like, I, you know what I mean? I, I think a lot of your uh, a lot of students still face this challenge of like they parents don't know what they do. And right. I, I think my parents still don't quite understand what my day to day looks like. Every phone call is like, okay, what did you discover today? And I'm like, mm. I don't know. Like it doesn't happen on a daily basis. <laughs> it happens on a, a yearly time scale. So I don't think they quite understand what the day to day is like. Um, and I think throughout grad school, they were seriously questioning my life choices. What you're making twenty thousand dollars a year? You moved to America <laughs> to be away from your family. You're not making any money. You're spending ridiculous hours at work. Um, what exactly are you trying to do? And right. for me to constantly explain that I just got to wait five years and do this, and there will be a nice career track after, um, was really confusing to them. They just urged me to come back and like. Um, you know, take over the, whatever they've built for me. Um, and so it was a constant struggle for me convincing them that this was a viable career track because they've never seen it. Mm. Um, also, they didn't want me going through such a hard life for $20,000 a year. Um, and I actually think that the COVID pandemic helped a lot in that sense. So mm. um, COVID happened right as I started my own independent position at Scripps. And it was this uh, almost public messaging uh, of how important science was and all these scientists are working at the forefront of developing a vaccine that made them feel proud for the first time. It Mm. wasn't my PhD graduation. It wasn't me starting an independent position, but it was the public messaging around, um, you know, hey, your daughter is a scientist. What does she think about this variant or what does she think about this vaccine? That attention from the public and the media about how important it was to discover drugs. And the, I think it opened the public's eyes for the first time here and broadly in the world about how vaccines are made that made them first be interested in what I do, um, but second, that this was actually important for it. So yeah. uh, thanks, but no thanks, COVID. Yeah, right. I was going to say, it's a, quite a shame it took COVID to kind of get that recognition, but it is, it is what it is now. And uh I'm sure that I'm sure they're super proud of you now. Um, But kind of going going back, though, to uh, that transition from the I I would love to hear, you know, because the city of University of New York, is that in downtown New York? Is that like or where? where Oh, it's actually in this uh, Queens. It's in one of the boroughs. Um, It's in Queens. It's about an hour subway ride away from downtown Manhattan. Um, Queens is still pretty, but, you know, Queens is still legit, though. It's it's, pop, uh, it's populated a lot, um, yeah. and uh, the Queens College is not always known for its STEM um, program. It's known mostly for its uh, teaching and educational programs. Uh, but this was the place that uh, helped me get a scholarship. They provided a little bit of funding for me to come, um, but I, at the same time, it was my first time to be in a research laboratory, and that was such an eye-opening experience for me that made yeah. me decide to become a scientist. How was the, I, I just want to hear your first impressions of, you know, New York and America in general when you first landed here. I don't, like, I don't know how you envisioned it when you were in, like, in the Philippines versus, because I'm sure it's a crazy, it was a tr- crazy change. I, I don't, oh, actually, I don't know. Manila is probably a populated city, so I, I don't know. Uh, but It is quite populated, but um, I think my, I, I, that was my first time coming to America. My initial, my initial impression or what I hope to see from Queens, which is now obviously wrong, was uh, kind of uh, what Friends is like, the show, the TV ah, show. I love Friends. <laughs> love that. Obviously, yeah. I was wrong. Queens is very different from Manhattan. Yeah. Um, also, I think the uh, the biggest shell shock for me was the um, the apartment quality. That, you know, how 
people, how Monica and Ross and yeah, Rachel actually, afforded their nah, apartment. Yeah. Nah, how they afforded that apartment is uh, beyond me. It's just TV right. show. All right. It's, yeah, it was a, yeah, they, they, they were straight up lying in friends. No one actually lives like that. <laughs> Those apartments probably were, they must have been, what, 10,000 a month, if I had to guess. Like, those, that's probably what we're listening what those apartments would have been like. But um, in any case, you so you're now here in New York, and you're seeing a, a real research lab for the first time. You know, what were you what were you doing in, a, in as your undergrad research? Like, what kind of uh, work mm -hmm. were you doing? Um, to be honest with you, I came as a pre-med student, so mm. even ended up taking the MCAT towards the end of my undergrad degree. Um, but um, the program at Queens College mm -hmm. required you to take a laboratory course mm -hmm. as a research course. And um, I was looking around for potential labs to be in. And uh, this professor, Robert Engel, took me under his lab, and they were working on how to functionalize chemically. Um, these textiles for the army so that we could make them antimicrobial. Um, obviously, soldiers at the front line are experiencing a lot of attacks, not just from um, people, but also from pathogens, especially if they go overseas. And these pathogens often are uh, becoming more and more antimicrobial resistant. And so mm -hmm. they wanted to come up with a way for um, uh, the uniforms to be um, functionalized chemically easily and more and on the affordable front so that the, um, they could be protected against these pathogens. And so that was my first exposure to, um, what research life is like. Um, basically we, in this case, we were looking at the hydroxyl groups on carbohydrates on the textiles and seeing what kinds of chemistries could be easily used to convert a hydroxy group towards something that could be antimicrobial in this sense the science behind it was we could functionalize textiles with a carb with a cationic group cationic group tends to interact with negatively charged bacterial membranes and then when they interact then you would kind of pop open uh, or destroy the um, bacterial membrane um, and so that positive charge became really important mm -hmm. so chemistry wise it was pretty easy you take a cationic group in this case we took quaternary cationic groups um, and then um, created an SN2 functionality to append them to the carboxy groups of the textiles. Mm. That's, really, that's really interesting. Really good uh, stuff, for, especially for like an undergraduate level. I think that's, that's super cool. That, the idea of like those textiles, like I'm sure it's very, uh, very, very hands-on, very applicable. So I'm sure it's very, <laughs> really cool to see. Um, it is. Uh, so after your undergraduate experience, you liked it so much, you wanted to keep going, I guess. And, you know, so then you attended uh, your graduate studies at NYU with, uh, I think, Professor Kent Kirschenbaum, I think. From, That's right. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I, uh, you know, how was that? I, well, I guess looking back now, it was an easy decision, but, you know, what was kind of uh, the decision like leading into getting your PhD? Um, I think at that point, even after taking the MCAT, I was seriously having doubts as to how I would be successful as a physician. I'm thinking of the day-to-day -day <laughs> of a doctor versus that of a scientist. I mean, Never knew that I, this was the first time in my life, I think, being in America and uh, being alone, having the opportunity to, like, think about work that deeply. Um, and I really love that process of being a detective and thinking about new ways, what kind of, what kinds of other chemical groups could we add on to the carbohydrates, what kinds of textiles or chemical groups could be amenable to this process. And even fundamentally, the recognition event between cationic groups and the negatively charged bacterial membrane um, you know, what's causing these charges to be present on these surfaces as well? And how could we tweak the strength of the electrostatic interaction to make them better antimicrobials? Mm -hmm. I found that process to be very engaging and I, I enjoyed it. And I love being alone and like thinking of how to improve my own experimental hands. And, and so much so that I applied to PhD programs and um, work by Professor Kent Kirchenbaum at NYU just really intrigued me. Um, I wanted to now, his research basically takes into account how nature functions to exhibit all these cool functions, including antimicrobial properties, what does nature have in its arsenal to um, combat um, pathogens. And that's when I started working with these peptoid molecules, which are essentially mimetics of peptides. You take your um, uh, polyamide backbone, 
um, from a peptide and then simply shift the R group from the amide to the, towards that of the alpha carbon and you get what the peptoid is. And that simple shift in the uh, functional groups makes peptoids um, protease resistant, which is nice if you're starting to think of um, biological systems and there are proteases all over. And one of the big reasons why peptide drugs are, aren't, aren't drugs is they get cleaved off by proteases. And so these peptoids are attractive as a platform because they're protease resistant. They may or may not have the secondary structures that peptides have, but at least you have the same kinds of chemistry that you can potentially think of as amino acids having in terms of the R group diversity. You now move that towards the, um, uh, 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 the amide nitrogen and the peptoid, and you can think of using amines as your diversity step. So um, from that standpoint, um, peptoids were attractive for potential biomedical applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of that went over my head. I'm sure. <laughs> I need to. I need to. I need to. I, I wish I had a stronger background in biology, but I think that was super succinct. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I uh, the idea of the uh, maybe we should take a step back because I guess the one question I had then is like, what is a protease? Those, those are just enzymes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes. A protease is basically just these really abundant proteins or enzymes in cells. Yeah. And their main job is to chop up proteins or peptides. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. I hear. It. Okay. That makes sense now. I, I follow that. So now quick question. Though, dude, what was, so like, what's the day to day? I know, I know things change, you know, as graduate students, but generally speaking, what was kind of the day to day for you as a graduate student? Like what was kind of like your, your typical work to at the bench? Um, at NYU, you teaching, you had to be a TA as well. I think mm. I taught for the first four years of my graduate career. So I would say on a, I tried to function or train myself, you know, as an undergrad, you don't think of yourself as training how to work, but I actually did try as a grad student to train myself to work for about 10 to 12 hours of a day. Um, and so how that 10 to 12 hours was broken down was some parts of it may be a quarter was into teaching because you have a lab class and that's going to be a huge chunk of time. Um, the correcting um, homeworks for students or attending these recitations. I don't know if people still have them these days, oh, yeah. the smaller lectures. Um, so teaching took up a good component of the 10 to 12 hour workday. And then lab uh, as a grad student would be a lot of be making the molecules. Um, these are made via solid base we call sub monomer synthesis instead of salt-based peptide synthesis. But again, the, the beauty of it is you're not using amino acids as building blocks, you're using just simple amines as building blocks. Mm -hmm. um, I started working on generating libraries of these peptoids that we can later on screen for uh, antimicrobial applications. So I'd say um, a lot of it was uh, chemistry and then um, when I was beginning in the lab, just learning how to think of biology and starting to follow and shadow a, a senior graduate student on how they did this work. Um, I was really fortunate that this work, the antimicrobial work that I was doing was done in collaboration with um, uh, uh, an awesome microbiologist at the NYU Medical School mm -hmm. um, with Professor Victor Torres. Um, and he was a specialist in methicillin resistant staph aureus. So we were testing our compounds that I would be making in the lab. And then I would take the subway up, which took about half an hour or so to get to the medical school and testing them using these clinical isolates that he had. So that was a really cool experience. So 25% uh, teaching, I'd say 25% on chemistry, 25% biology, something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Now, towards the end of your graduate um, experience. I presume you kind of had thoughts about doing a postdoc. I, um, I know you did part of your postdoc at Yale, part of it at UCSD. Um, was it, you know, tell us a little about, you know, at this point, were you thinking about becoming a professor? Was that kind of really in what you really wanted to do or love to hear about that, the inception of yeah. that? Um, as a graduate student, I was pretty quiet. I wasn't necessarily super confident about my skills as an experimentalist. So I kept my desire to be a professor, very quiet. I didn't tell anyone. Mm. Um, and 
nor did I really have the confidence to sort of tell people that I wanted to be a PI. It just seemed like such an esteemed job that was reserved for the top uh, upper echelon of people. Um, and you know what? I think it wasn't until my fourth year of graduate school when we are supposed to write up an original research proposal. And I proposed uh, this work. And um, one of my committee members, Professor Laura Mahal, who's now in uh, University of Alberta, she read that and was like super positive about it. She said, this is among the most creative proposals I've ever read. Um, I, 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 I had she seriously enjoyed reading it. That was one of the first instances that I felt like, oh, one, I really liked the process of writing this proposal, but two, she really liked it too. So maybe there's like something there as a potential career track for me as a PI. <laughs> and I think, uh, along in parallel with her comments, which as a grad student, I kind of felt like that was the first time someone said anything positive to me. Wow. <laughs> um, and in parallel to that, I think my own research in the Kirschenbaum lab was maturing as well. And I started giving out, uh, uh, going out to give talks um, about my work and people were positive about it. Um, and I think the, just the positive encouragement from the community um, based on the growth that I've had and also the creative ideas that I was putting into a paper, into paper, uh, made me feel a little bit more confident about telling people that I wanted to be a professor. That's, um, that's awesome. And I actually, I, I kind of vividly remember taking my PI out, Kent, um, taking him out to lunch one day and be like, randomly asking him out to lunch and saying, I, I, can I talk to you about some queer stuff? I'd love to buy you lunch over. So I bought, I bought him lunch and like, I asked him for a frank discussion for my prospects as a potential uh, prof as a professor at the end and it's super competitive he was pretty um, upfront about what the challenges I might face and um, what I should be willing to compromise also to pursue this career track but nevertheless he seemed positive about uh, my potential so this was all really encouraging for me. But even with that, I actually applied to industry jobs um, uh, at the end of my PhD, but also postdocs, since I wasn't sure, you know, what I really wanted to do or what I was capable of. And at the end of my PhD, I was kind of teetering between a uh, $100,000 job in industry versus uh, $27,000 as a postdoc. And really enticing. I, I, was, I know I was so agonized over this decision. Um, and at the time, I think what came down to me deciding a postdoc over that industry based job was the fact that at the time you, it wasn't easy to go back from industry to academia. Right. Sure. I felt like I'm in my 20s. This is like a time to take risks. Um, there's opportunity cost of doing a postdoc, but you know, if this things didn't work out, I could probably make the jump to industry rather than going to industry and coming back to academia. So right. that, that was it. I hear that a lot. I think if, we, like if you're, if you're in academia, it's, it's so hard to, if you, I say, if you've been out of academia for like anything over, like, I would say over like a year or two, it's really hard to get and kind of get back into that group. Generally speaking, at least from what I've heard. Um, I think it's changing a lot these days with the rapid fluctuations in, in the economy and how the market's going. So mm. I th I'd say a year ago, you know, students were being poached out of their PhD programs to go work in industry, but that's changing a lot now. Um, and so there's people coming back who didn't do a postdoc that went straight to industry and are now coming back and thinking that they want to pursue uh, more creative science and do a postdoc. So I think the the, mar the landscape has changed and people thinking of um, pursuing both of these opportunities are more welcome to move back and forth. Yeah, I uh, and just, it must've been incredibly rewarding to kind of hear those positive words of encouragement too from, you know, your, um, well, your advisors really and people you look up to. I mean, there's, you know, it, it, I get that, you know, people work hard to, get to themselves where they're at, but it really goes a long way, I think, for to hear from other people, I think. It, those you know, words of encouragement are super critical, I think. And especially it's especially during that time when you're thinking about career choices and basically it sounds to me like they kind of edge you to do to do the academia route. You know, um, I, I don't know that they would I would say that they did that because they had been through it and and you know, it's tough. It's mm. like you, you got you gotta be you gotta have tough skin. 
um, be, but at the same time, I think they really enjoyed it. But I don't know that they necessarily pushed me towards academia. I feel like I still provided the right. uh, drive for it. Um, but they were very supportive in, in many ways in terms of reading and providing feedback on my materials. And I think there, there's also something, you know, receiving that positive feedback later on in my graduate career, as opposed to my earlier days, made me feel like I really earned it. Mm -hmm. um, I made a conscious choice um, in my graduate training to be better than what I was. Um, and I knew how I was deficient just by observing my um, other peers. Um, I wasn't reading papers fast enough. I wasn't, my hands weren't as good at pipetting. Um, I wasn't making structures on chem as fast as other people could. Like skills like that, but I think also in critical thinking, um, um, I it, it took me some time to sort of reflect on how a paper is constructed, um, what the necessary or the, what the most important questions of a field were. It just took me some time to sort of mature and uh, sort of earn my stripes. So sure. for someone for to go through that in first four years of my graduate career and having earned that um, small comment from my advisors at the end felt rewarding to me that I had been working towards something. And these are things that you don't necessarily see reflected sometimes. A lot of that is like in your internal um, thinking that's maturing. So for them to have recognized it towards the end felt really rewarding. Right. Well, it certainly paid off now um, and it definitely um, want to hop to your research now in scripts because I definitely want to make sure we have plenty of time to, to discuss that. It, it, I mean, the glycone chemistry, glycosylation chemistry. I was actually posting through publications. For anyone out there, I you know plug to I think your review on glycan binding. Um, got kind of uh, last year, literally a year ago. It was super useful. Um, look, as far as I understand, glycan modifications are kind of they help regulate cell recognition and function um and let's say understanding protein and, and lipid substrates to carbohydrate molecules and let's see and i think glycosylation is kind of important for biological processes like protein folding i think as far as all, that's about really all I know. So I'm, I'm going to let you take the floor here and really kind of let you go into your research. It's super unique. That's good. Super, super um, cool. You know, I approach my research as being the fourth, uh, you know, there's four major biomolecules, proteins, nucleic acid, lipids, and glycans. Mm. Um, proteins and DNA, you can really connect towards each other and also RNA. Um, DNA becomes RNA, RNA becomes protein. So it's kind of easier to connect what the protein structure and protein, sorry, a sequence might look like based on knowing the genetic code. Lipids on, and glycans, on the other hand, felt really intriguing to me as a scientist because you couldn't go back, you couldn't easily go back to the someone's DNA sequence and say, here's the exact glycan composition this person would have or the cell would have. Mm. There's basically, um, even if someone... I mean, we now know what the human uh, genome looks like, and still it's challenging to predict what glycosylation in the cell might look like. Nevertheless, how we know that they're important is if you remove some parts of the cellular machinery responsible for making these glycans, then all of these cellular functions that are important towards development um, are messed up. So... I became really intrigued in the study of the sugars, just like many others were. And I think that when I was starting my independent lab, um, I was kind of keenly looking at where the major problems are, were and where my skill sets were best suited. I'm not the best carbohydrate chemist in the world. Uh, I'm also not the best um, biologist in the world, but where I'm good at is making connections between chemistry and biology and how we can devise new techniques that are rooted in chemistry to be able to understand um, what glycans do in the cell. And I think um, what's driving my research right now is we, we know that glycans are important. Um, again, like we knock out pieces of the biosynthetic machinery and the cell like is messed up. Um, but what we don't know is the resolution to which which proteins or which lipids bear these specific glycan structures. So um, these biosynthetic enzymes that install glycans can act on thousands of different proteins in the cell. 
how it chooses each protein to install which glycan is not quite uh, clear to us. But when we did, when we do look um, by analytical based techniques like mass spectrometry, we do know that some proteins have very unique sugars on them, and that sometimes when these changes in sugars occur in their structure, then it signals something bad towards the cell. So I, I, I'm kind of hand waving here. Uh, but the main driver for my research was to identify which proteins have the pathogenic, sometimes glycan motifs that the cell uses as a recognition motif. Quick question about the the mass spec. Something that kind of puzzles me, or something that you know, I really don't get, is how like mass spectroscopy kind of helps you understanding these such a lot. Like it, it only tells you molecular weight, right? So I don't really. I would love to hear about how you guys utilize mass spec for these types of techniques to understand like chemical um, structure, because other than like molecular weight, it doesn't seem like that'd be really useful. I, I, I don't know. I'd love to. Um, molecular well, weight is your first clue, obviously. Um, you have some clue by knowing what the M over Z is that you can predict based off of the glycan structure. Oh, okay. um, that makes sense. Um, but the other way that mass spec and, uh, is useful is to tell us linkage. So if I take a monosaccharide, which is a fundamental building block of glycans, um, there's at least five other hydroxy groups that I could connect another monosaccharide to. And those would be isomers of each other if, if I functionalize all of the, if I functionalize that one monosaccharide with a new monosaccharide, um, there's five different ways that I can connect them. And so that initial M over Z doesn't tell you how they're linked. So they're regional isomers of each other. Uh, but you can use different kinds of ionization techniques and or different enzymes, for example, to can selectively, which can selectively cleave off the sugars and to tell us what the linkage might be. So that's another way of um, how mass spec is used for. Okay. And so I guess another another question I have then is, I maybe, maybe explain it, but I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. I don't quite get how, like, the chemistry of understanding this, the, like, let's say the, well, let's say, okay, let me take it back. So from an application standpoint, this type of chemistry is great for understanding cancer biology and like stem cells, I think. So how, how, how does that work from a chemical point of view? Like what, like, what are you guys doing that like, how allows you to answer these questions in applications? I guess, hopefully that's, hopefully it's not a complicated question. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that at the fundamental level, we're trying to understand what's happening between healthy and disease. So okay. if you take, if you use mass spec and identify all the sugars in a healthy cell and compare that to the sugars with, in a disease cell, what is changing? And why is that change um, causing the cell to behave differently? Mm. Um, so that usually occurs via that new sugar that appeared in disease interacting with a protein so if you could identify what protein the sugar is presented on, as well as which pathogenic glycan binding protein is within that complex, and how that interaction is causing that effect that you're seeing, then you could potentially create ways to, let's say, disrupt that interaction. So what if you could design small molecules or antibodies that could selectively disrupt or inhibit the interaction between your glycoprotein that's in disease as well as that pathogenic glycan binding protein is sort of the ultimate dream mm -hmm. so i think it's a um understanding the uh, biology at a molecular level allows you to come up with new chemical matter so that you can interrupt that interaction and disease as well okay that makes that makes a lot more sense um and then you know last question i have then because I, like I mentioned, I'm not really in this this realm of space. So what what does kind of the day to day look like for, you know, yourself or one of your graduate students in the lab? Like, how do you guys how do you answer these questions, like on the day to day? Like, what does that kind of look like? Um, I think that uh, my lab functions uh, very much in like a uh, a team. So usually um, there's this bigger question that we're trying to answer, and then graduate students spend a good time sort of developing new tech, gaining new techniques from someone else, like a senior graduate student or a postdoc, something like glycomics, mass spectrometry, but they tend to bring their own um, expertise to the table as well, something like cell biology or biochemistry. 
And so the small team is um, using their unique experiences um, and previous background to answer that same question. Um, let's say if we're trying to identify the glycoprotein that a pathogenic glycan binding protein is um, interacting with one student in that team who has a background in cell biology, maybe doing some genetic knockouts of this candidate glycoprotein and then seeing what the function is in the cell. Another student who has more of a mass spec background um, is now harvesting the sugars from this protein to analyze them by mass spec. And then another might be thinking about screens um, so that we can create inhibitors of this interaction. So, so everyone kind of brings something to the table, and I, that's how I often think about constructing smaller teams. But at the same time, they can learn from each other. So the mass spec person is now learning a little bit of some biology from someone who's more experienced to it. The questions and the experiments that they do on a daily basis still work towards answering the bigger question. Right. And it's definitely a uh, that's 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 awesome to hear. It's very uh, well. My impression is it's a very unique experience. Like having really a diverse group of grad students with different backgrounds to enter work with one another. Um, my impression is that obviously, like let's say a PI has many different projects, but um, it's all kind of within you know a certain field. But it sounds like you really have a students who are really their backgrounds are entirely different which is really cool and uh you know it, it takes a lot of communication for that to work and it doesn't always work we often sometimes have to reconstruct what a team looks like and what mm. the experimental aims are sometimes there are multiple experiments to answer the same question so we just kind of take advantage of what the student's interested in and what they can bring to the table uh, towards the, answering that question yeah well me i want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today it was a, it was a pleasure talking with you and hearing about your 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 chemistry and how, and its applications for biology was super cool and your experiences as well i think this will be extremely insightful for a lot of uh, people listening so just want to thank you for your time awesome thanks for inviting me aiden all right everyone well thank you for another episode and we'll see you in the next one okay bye